Praise the Lord, everybody, and everybody praise the Lord. My name is Elder Jael Russell, International Sunday School Sergeant at Arms, and we greet you all in that wonderful name, Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank and praise God for each and every one of you that tuned in tonight. And we just want to wish everybody a uh, happy Black History Month. Uh, we're getting towards the, you know, the end of the month, but we got a special treat uh, for you tonight. We're going to learn about the history of the Church of our Lord Jesus Christ. And our facilitator tonight is Alexander C. Stewart, all the way from Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, you'll be hearing from him shortly. But before I hand the service, there's the broadcast over to him. I want to give honor to whom honor is due. First, giving honor to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who's ahead of my life. To our, our presiding apostle, Apostle James I. Clark. To our vice presider, Apostle James May. To the entire board of apostles, the entire board of bishops, the entire board of presbyters. To our advisor to the youth, Bishop Reginald Davis. To our international Sunday school superintendent, Sister Dolores Griffin and the entire International Sunday School Association stands, staff. And once again, we greet you all in that wonderful name, Lord Jesus Christ. And before uh, we get into the uh, workshop tonight, we got a special treat. We have another solo from Sister Diane Garrett, all the way from Orangeburg, South Carolina, and she'll be blessing us with a selection. So um, stay tuned for this great selection that uh, from Sister Diane Garrett and following uh, her selection. Yeah, I'll be introducing again Alexander, you know, Stewart, and the broadcast will be all his. So I'm going to bless you with this special treat from Sister Diane Garrett. You'll be blessed in Jesus' name.
We thank and praise God for Sister Diane Garrett for blessing us with that wonderful selection. It is well with my soul. And I pray that it is well with each and every one of you tonight. Hope that song encouraged you, no matter what you're going through. It is well, hallelujah. Knowing that Jesus, hallelujah, is with you tonight. He said he'll never leave us nor forsake us. And he that is in us is greater than him that's in the world. So without further ado, I want to hand the remainder of the broadcast into the hands of Deacon Alexander Stewart. Deacon Alexander Stewart, the broadcast is all yours. Thank you, Elder Russell, and I thank you for that introduction. And I say greetings to everyone, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. We are living in exciting times, and we are so grateful to God for allowing us this opportunity to share with you um, some of the history of the Church of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I give honor and thanks to our International Sunday School Superintendent, uh, Missionary Dolores Griffin. She's doing a fantastic job and she's a history in the maker herself. So I wanna say thank all of you that are listening and to Missionary Griffin. This evening, we're gonna look at the history of the Church of Our Lord Jesus Christ from a different perspective that we are um, normally accustomed with. What I want to look at is some of the factors that helped influence Bishop Lawson, who is the founder of the Church of Our Lord Jesus Christ of the Apostolic Faith. Under his leadership, the Church of Our Lord Jesus Christ became the second largest African-American oneness Pentecostal denomination in the United States. So I, I want to discuss the history because it makes the history of Church of Our Lord Jesus Christ is significant to religious and African American history. So we have to, um, it has not had its rightful place. So I want to encourage my listening viewers to be interested in the history of your church is something that you can be proud of. You know, there's nothing wrong with you writing assignment in school and using your church as, as, as a, um, as a topic, um, because we have a history that's very unique in regard to Pentecostalism, notably African-American Pentecostalism. My objectives today, next, um, if you look at the next slide, is I have three objectives. The first one, I want to look at the impact of the Harlem, res, uh, res, um, the Harlem res, Renaissance on the Church of Our Lord Jesus Christ. My second objective is for us to note the cultural impact that the Church of Our Lord Jesus Christ had on African American religion. And my third objective, I wanna look a little bit at the hymnology of the, of the church, of especially the early church of the Lord Jesus Christ on the Christian faith. As you would see on the next slide, now this is just a, a rough um, introduction of Bishop Lawson and his ministry. Bishop Lawson began his ministry in the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World, and he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in 1913 in Indianapolis, Indiana at the Apostolic Faith Assembly. And that church at that time was pastored by Elder Garfield Thomas Hayward. Now it was through Hayward that Bishop Lawson, who was an elder at that time, he was not a bishop, he was an elder, and he was a general elder. He was appointed to pastor the Apostolic Faith Church in Columbus, Ohio. That church was founded in 1910. It was in March of 1919 that Bishop Lawson renamed the church as the Church of Christ of the Apostolic Faith. This church was a multiracial congregation. And Bishop Hayward's church in Ohio that Bishop Lawson got saved at, or received the baptism of the Holy Ghost there, was 60% Black and 40% White. Bishop Lawson's church also founded 
suit, his early churches were integrated with African Americans and European Americans. And the church in Harlem, Refuge Temple, was also a multiracial church during its early days. Now, in 1914, his churches became known as the Church of Christ of the Apostolic Faith. And at one time he was pastoring or he was over um, a, a church that he started in San Diego, Texas. And that church was known as the Lincoln Park Church of Christ of the Apostolic Faith. He also started a church in St. Louis, Missouri that was called Temple Church of Christ of the Apostolic Faith. And he also was asked by some people in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania for a pastor. And he sent to that church, Bishop at that time was the elder, Sherrod Johnson. And that church was known as the Philadelphia Church of our Lord, of Church of Christ of the Apostolic Faith. And of course we know that in 1919, he established the Refuge Church of Christ of the Apostolic Faith. So this was a um, association of churches that he was, I would use the term overseer. And those churches made up his Church of Christ of the Apostolic Faith. Um, the church in Columbus, Ohio became his headquarters and he evangelized up and down the Midwest um, with that church being his base. And that's how he founded the church in San Diego and also in St. Louis. Um, and Bishop Lawson was such a convincing man of the apostolic faith that he converted two churches to the oneness movement. One was the Emmanuel Baptist Temple and the other was the um, Christian faith band, which later became Church of God Apostolic. So Bishop Lawson's influence was outside also um, the Pentecostal tradition. In 1920, the headquarters of his association of churches was moved to Refuge Temple, excuse me, at that time it was Refuge Church of Christ of the Apostolic Faith. It was in 1931 that the denomination was incorporated in the um, state of New York as the Church of our Lord Jesus Christ of the Apostolic Faith. So we know the transition. When he started the organization, it was called Church of Christ of the Apostolic Faith. And then in 1931, he named it the Church of our Lord Jesus Christ of the Apostolic Faith. Next slide, please. Okay, when he founded Refuge, Temp um, Refuge Church of Christ of the Apostolic Faith, the church grew, I mean, and it grew. And they needed larger headquarters. Remember, there was 133rd Street. And Bishop Lawson bought a building on 124th Street and 7th Avenue. That building was built in the 1800s, and it was called the Harlem Casino. It was a five-story building, and it was a casino. It had restaurants, it had a bowling alley, and it was used as a, um, you know, as a recreational area. Now, one thing about Harlem during the 1880s, Harlem was a white middle-class neighborhood. And, and what happened is, is that the area became overdeveloped. They had buildings and apartment buildings, and there was not people, um, there was not people to fill the buildings. And this led to middle-class blacks moving to Harlem. And during the 18 I mean, the early 1900s, the white people living in Harlem, they tried to keep the blacks out, but they were unsuccessful. It, and so, it, and that led to um, the whites leaving Harlem. And as they left, middle-class blacks moved in. I would like to, on oh, next slide, please. Now, I want to discuss a little bit about the Harlem Renaissance. The Harlem Renaissance ran from about 1910 to 1940. So this is a 30-year period. And now, uh, the Harlem, Re um, uh, Harlem Renaissance was originally called 
the New Negro Movement, okay? And, and it was a cultural revolution. It, it, Harlem, it made Harlem, New York's, the Black cultural mecca for Black Americans. It was the golden age of African-American culture and also it instilled a Black pride within Black America. So it gave a quality and dignity to Blackness. It was, uh, you saw a, a, a surge uh, and a, a, a cultural identity given Black people, Black Americans through music, theater, arts, and religion. So, so um, cultural identity, next slide. Now, Harlem became the Mecca, the Black Mecca, and Harlem became the world's largest concentration of Blacks in the United States. 1.5 million Blacks um, lived in Harlem. Okay, from 1910 to 1920, the hardship in the South and the sharecroppers losing jo their jobs, especially after World War I, caused many Blacks to leave the South and migrate up North. It was by 1920 that there were 300,000 Blacks that moved from the South to the North and Harlem became a destination for many Southern Blacks. And as I stated, that the racial tensions in the South led to the migration of many African Americans. And I said, so this led to the Harlem Renaissance. And the next slide, please. Now, when Bishop Lawson, he left Columbus, Ohio, he felt led of the Lord to leave Columbus, Ohio and travel to Harlem. Now, when he when arrived in Harlem, there was things going on in Harlem that was not so favorable towards black Americans. Now on July 20th, 1919, there was an argument between a white and black man over the World War I and it led to a fight. And this fight almost caused a riot but before the riot was able to take place, it was shut down by the police. Racial tensions in New York City left, led to a lot of violent attacks against Black Americans. So not only the South was um, racism in the South, but there was also racism in the North. Also what happened in the um, in Harlem during that time period frame between 1919 and 1920, Marcus Garvey became very prominent in the black community. He um, formed, established the, um, the newspaper called the Negro World. And also he established the Universal Negro Improvement Association. Marcus Garvey was very unique. He was not an African-American. He was a Jamaican from the Caribbean. But when he came to New York, he became very much involved in Pan-Africanism. And, and this led to him being the target of J. Edgar Hoover and also the FBI. And one thing about um, Marcus Garvey, he was an entrepreneur and he felt that Blacks should own their own businesses and that Blacks, all Blacks from the African diaspora need to support each other, um, uh, support their enterprises. And he founded the Black Star Line, which we know was a ship line. And he also had a Back to Africa movement where he was encouraging Blacks to move to um, Liberia, West Africa. And one thing about him also, he had grocery stores, restaurants, a laundry mat, and he had a hotel. As we look at the next slide, when Lawson arrived in New York City in July 1919, in Mother Orway's biography, she says, Elder Lawson, he came to New York unknown, unheard, and without a following, 
and without a place to worship. So when Bishop Lawson came to New York, he started his ministry, started basically from scratch. Next slide. What also influenced Bishop Lawson is Ethiopian ideology. Now, Ethiopianism as a belief developed in Africa, and it was the Africans' reaction to European colonization, European politics, and European religion. This philosophy or ideology developed during the late 18th century to the 20th century. And it also involved Pan-Africanism. And Pan-Africanism really came out of Ethiopianism. And Pan-African is the idea of, of African peoples supporting each other and becoming um, unified. And so, and this is a movement to not only to unite Africans and African Americans, but those African Caribbeans and also the African Europeans. As you would see in the next slide, the impact of the Renaissance on the church. Now, the, the scripture that started Ethiopianism is found in the book of Psalms, chapter 38 and verse 31. Princes shall come out of Egypt. Ethiopia shall soon stretch out her hands unto God. The African people and those of the diaspora found this as a motivation verse. They did not see themselves that as that God ordained them to be slaves or under European rule. It gave them self-dignity and self-worth because that they knew that they could rule their own countries or rule um, their own villages. Bishop Lawson embraced Ethiopianism and he was a Pan-Africanist. Lawson instilled racial pride in his people through the scriptures and taught that since African-Americans are not superior to white Americans, they must not accept racial discrimination or Jim Crow. Bishop Lawson wrote a letter to white men on prejudice while he was in Jamaica vacationing, he saw this pamphlet written by a white Baptist preacher. His name was Reverend Lavelle. And Bishop Lawson was appalled at that track the man wrote. And he was also appalled that he found it in a predominantly African-American country. Now, Dr. Levitt used the Bible to show the inferiority of African people. What Bishop Lawson did was write a man a letter using the same scriptures he did to show that the black man was not cursed, but he was chosen by God. As we see in the next slide, Bishop Lawson preached a gospel a, what they call a social gospel. And that is a gospel of liberation and racial uplift. Bishop Lawson's mantra was the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. Now he did not coin that term. Somebody else used the term, but that became his motto, his theme. Because he was saying if God loved all his creation and was the father of his creation, he wanted his children to be one, that there should be a unity, a brotherhood amongst humankind. According to Lawson, segregation, discrimination, and prejudice cannot exist in the kingdom of God. Why? Because the baptism of the Holy Spirit erases ethnic distinctions and all become one in the body of Christ. So he was, he developed a theology which some um, historians and scholars call anti-racist theology. So he felt that the paraxis of apostolicism and the word paraxis mean how you 
live out your beliefs? How do you live? Not what you say with your mouth, but how do you live it in your everyday actions and conversations? And he felt that prejudice cannot exist if you have a genuine baptism of the Holy Spirit. Next slide. Now, what Bishop Lawson did between, like, starting, I'll say, the mid 1920s, he started businesses. He started um, things to help lift his people. And what, one of the things that he did, he was able to obtain a boarding school. It used to be called the in Industrial um, School, and it was owned by the Methodist Church. And Bishop Lawson was able to get their school. It, it, which was in Southern Pines, North Carolina. And it, it was twofold. It was a boarding school from elementary school to high school. And it was also a orphanage. Bishop Bonin noted the disparities in the educational public school educational system. And so he wanted black children to have a quality education because he understood that to further our people to further educationally and financially, they had to have a good primary education. So he established the R.C. Lawson Institute. And I believe that it was he was one of the first in Pentecost amongst black people to establish a school, uh, elementary and high school, and also to have an orphanage. And I think that was phenomenal. And it was in the 1930 that he was able to organize this work, and he had the backing of the whole organization. Bishop Lawson did not work alone. He could not work alone. But the church rallied behind his, um, his goals, his, his dreams, his vision. They rallied behind it. Bishop Lawson noted that segregation is not just a separation of races, but it, it yields economic exploitation. It yields uh, 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 um, and degrades African-Americans' manhood and also womanhood. As a product of segregated South, Bishop Lawson stated in regard to racism, is it is it is extremely difficult for him to maintain, and he's referring to European Americans in the church, a symbolist of human dignity. At every turn, now he's referring to black people, he's hindered at the places he cannot enter because of the color of his skin. Churches, schools, restaurants, theaters, lunch counters, restrooms, not to mention the the wide job barriers. Living is made like a convict serving out a sentence. And this is how he saw his fellow African Americans being treated. However, he felt that the church was inclusively open to all with no distinction of race or gender. In an open letter that he wrote in a sermon called the um, letter to the Lycian church, and that's a sermon he preached in January of 1949. He states, you need to be in a spiritual church. The spiritual church makes you welcome. It is for white, it is for black, for rich, for poor, ignorant or uneducated. It's a universal church, not a denomination, but a spiritual church, not a lukewarm church, but a spirit-filled church, triumphant are you that are in the church, the Savior's bride. So that's how Bishop Lawson felt. He felt, he also used, um, he wrote a book called, the, it's a pamphlet, The Anthropology of Jesus Christ, Our Kingsman Redeemer. And he said in it, he used the genealogy of Christ showing that black people, that African people, that Hamites were in the bloodline of Christ. And because of that, he's the kingsman redeemer. So black people can claim heirs to Christ because we're a part of his bloodline. And not only him, but all of the races, 
the Shamites, the Hamites, the Jephites, or or bloodline is all in Jesus Christ. And that and because of that, he said that God makes us one. He insisted that segregation binds and hinders the body of Christ from working fellowshipping together. And God, since God has no respect of the person, he felt that he said, um, and I quote him on this, I trust that you are among those wise enough, and this he's talking to his white brethren, to correct these mistakes and the prejudices that are set forth. So that's what he wanted, that God will do something. Now, Bishop Lawson, with his Ethiopianism, because remember I said that's one of the things that influenced him. He saw the gospel as universal and ministered to all races. And that's an obedience to the commission of Christ. Because the commission is not for black people to witness to black people, white people to witness to only white people. We're to go into all the world and witness. It doesn't matter what nationality or what color they are. And, and Bishop Lawson did note he said that he has pastored a mixed congregation of black and white folks ever since he started pastoring. And he said, people can bear him witness that he have treated all people and showed them the same love of God, regardless to race or color. He said, because God showed him to esteem all men because they were made in the image of God. And according to historian, to Marge French, he stated that Lawson's first pastorate in Ohio quickly expanded into a successful interracial congregation. In, in 1928, there was in a newspaper article in the New York Age, it reported that during the ninth convention of the Church of Our Lord, Church of Christ of the Apostolic Faith, there was 80 Italians that were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And an Italian church was started in Mount Vernon, New York. And if you look at the 1930 minutes of the Church of Christ of the Apostolic Faith, you will see that there was an Italian church in Mount Vernon, New York. And what's also interesting is that one of the um, head deacons of the early church was an Italian man. Um, Bishop Law, and he even had some converted Jews attended um, Refuge Temple. Um, he had some converted Jews attended the church. As I stated, Lawson made no distinction between his white and black members. So you do not see racial classifications of membership in the denomination as it existed in some other groups during the time. Next slide, please. Now, the social impact is the businesses that Bishop Lawson started. And, and these businesses were, were really, it was started by the church. It was a church working together with the pastor. So there was unity. Now, Bishop Bono, I mean, Bishop Lawson was the leader, but the church supported these businesses. These businesses did two things for the community. They provided jobs and they provided services. So those are the two things he did. Now racism hindered in um, employment opportunities and economic growth, not only for those that lived in the Harlem community, but those members of his church and those of his organization. So in response to that, Lawson, and I believe that his studies at Howe University in um, Louisiana helped molded his skills. Now, Mother Thomas, I'm quoting Mother Thomas, Mabel Thomas. She said, in addition to being a man of God, successful in spiritual matters, Bishop Lawson also had a head for business and entered into several business enterprises. So the church had a, a, a um, the church had a bookstore, a record store, a grocery store, a, a he established a people's funeral home. And one thing that they had, um, they had a recording company. As we know that Bishop Lawson was a singer, 
and he recorded um, um, uh, he recorded made recordings of not only himself but of, of his members that were singers. This is one record, and I believe this record is probably from 1925 to 1930 that it was produced. And you know, it's a 78 um, LP, and it's called Pentecostal Records, and it was published or, or manufactured by the Church of Christ Record Company. So people um, know that Bishop Lawson or the Church of Christ had their own they had their own studio and it was producing their own records. Next slide, please. Okay, he was a songwriter. And what Christian songs do is that they teach theology. His songs had a message. They were, and, the, and not only him, but all the early apostolic writings. I mean, and singers and, and songwriters, their music had a message. It was twofold. It was not only a song of worship, but it was a song that taught theology. It taught doctrine. It taught apostolic doctrine. And I would use, for example, his song that um, God is great and greatly to be praised. What does that song teach us? Is, are we singing it because the beat sounds good? or okay, Because all the early hymns taught theology. They taught something. So in, some, in Bishop Lawson's songs, he taught, um, count me worthy to escape. When you hear that song, he's talking about the rapture. He's talking that Jesus is coming and he's coming for a prepared people. When he says God is great and greatly to be praised, who's to be praised? He's talking about the oneness of God. He's talking about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit uh, as in an ontological relationship that they make up the one God, that God is the Father, God is the Son, God is the Holy Spirit, and Jesus is his name. And I'm so glad that his songs, which he comp were composed early, was found in the Songs of Christ. And that was a songbook, a hymnal produced by the Church of Christ. And also we find them in um, um, PAWs, the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World, their hymnal, the Bridegroom Songs. A few of his songs that Bishop Lawson wrote are sung outside the oneness tradition. So not only did oneness people sing his songs, but also Trinitarians did also. Next slide, please. Now, one part of Bishop Lawson's entrepreneurship is that he was able to obtain 120 acres in Shrub Oak, New York. And that's in Putnam, Poly, Putnam County, New York. Lawson was on the board of the Lawsburg Development Corporation. And that corporation was founded by attorney Sumter H. Locke. Now, attorney Locke was the first black district attorney in New York City. And Bishop Lawson befriended him. They, be, they were friends. And upon Locke, um, Locke's death, the property was sold to Lawson. And this is significant. I want you young people to realize it, that Bishop Lawson and the Church of Our Lord Jesus Christ, they had a 121 acres, and it became a, an African American summer resort. Remember, because of racism, people, you know, black people couldn't go anywhere. They couldn't go to every beach, hotels, everything. So Bishop Lawson um, had this property, and it became known as Lawsonville, and it consisted of a hotel was on a great. Uh, um, grocery store, gas station, it had a cattle barn, and it even had bundles on it. And also, which is still in existence today on the property, is a cemetery. And it's called Emanuel Cemetery. And both um, Locke, Attorney Locke, and Bishop Lawson are buried there. And Bishop Lawson's buried there with his first wife, um, Carrie Fields Lawson. Next slide, please. Now, this I think is very interesting. The Ethiopian World Fellowship. 
It was founded in 1931, and the purpose of it was to support Ethiopia during the Italian invasion. And also, it was also to unify the Africans of the Diasporas. Lawson became president of this Pan-African movement in 1951, and he encouraged Black Americans and Black Caribbeans to immigrate to Ethiopia. Now, this is significant. We always talk about Marcus Garvey with his Back to Africa movement, but we don't talk about, and you don't hear much talk about this hidden history. That's why it's good to do research and dig because you'd be surprised what you find out if you really do research. Bishop Lawson encouraged Black Americans to support Ethiopia. Now we know that Ethiopia was the only country in Africa that was not under colonial rule. And we know that Italy under Mussolini tried to subjugate Ethiopia, but under Emperor Haile Selassie, they were able to prevent that. For all the work that Bishop Lawson did, he was bestowed the Star of Ethiopia in 1951. And that is the highest honor that a civilian can receive from the Ethiopian government. That is very significant, very significant. Now, Bishop Lawson, an apostolic Jesus-only preacher, becoming the leader of this organization is phenomenal. It is very phenomenal. And it was shows the work of Bishop Lawson. See, he put his spirituality into action. And that was very important. That was very important. Next slide, please. So this is a, a newspaper clipping from the New York Age Defender, um, August 7th, 1954. And it shows here's Bishop Lawson receiving the Star of Ethiopia. And we see Hollis Selassie there. Um, and we see Bishop, um, excuse me, the mayor receiving um, Bob Wagner of New York City. This is significant and this is part of our history. So I want our young people to be proud to be church of our Lord Jesus Christ of the apostolic faith. Next slide. Now, in 1957, there was a pilgrimage for prayer. And the purpose of this, and it was a march on Washington, really, this was the first march on Washington. And the purpose of the march was to for voter rights. Because you know, there was a time when black Americans could not vote. In fact, people died for us to be able to vote today. And Bishop Lawson was a part of that struggle. So they had a, a pilgrimage, a march on May 17th, 1957, 25,000 people attended that event. And that event is what made Martin Luther King famous. He delivered a speech at that march called Give Us the Ballot. And that speech put him on, you know, put him on, uh, made him um, gain public notoriety. Now in the picture, you see Bishop Lawson praying and giving remarks at the podium. But behind him, you see a young Martin Luther King. Next slide. And Bishop Lawson, he prayed against racial prejudice. He marched against racial prejudice. He was a unique religious leader, a unique Pentecostal leader. The cultural impact that the Church of Our Lord Jesus Christ of the Apostolic Faith had on African American religious religion is one, the Pentecostal message of love. The Pentecostal message of love, that God can save anyone. And that when a person is baptized in water in the name of the Lord Jesus, no matter what color they are, they take on 
the nature of Christ and they become one, not only with Christ, but with fellow believers. Also, the cultural impact on the Church of Our Lord Jesus Christ was not only Pentecostal experience and doctrine, but also the hymns that were wrote. Because the hymns of the Church of Christ, of the apostolic faith, influenced the Christian work because it the words of the song reinforce biblical principles and biblical doctrine. But I'm going to close now with this prayer, Bishop Lawson, that we may be able to be free from racial prejudice. Oh God, who has made man in thine own image and likeness, and who does love all whom thou has made, suffer us not because of the difference of race, color, or condition to separate ourselves from others and thereby from thee. But teach us the unity of the family and university of thy love. As thou, Savior, as a son was born of a Hebrew mother who had the blood of many nations in her veins and ministered first to thy brethren of the Israelites, but rejoice in the faith of the Syrophoenician woman and of a Roman soldier, and suffered your cross to be carried by an Ethiopian. Teach us also while loving and serving our own to enter into the communion of the whole family and forbid that from pride of birth, color, achievement, and hardness of heart, we should despise any for whom Christ died or injure or grieve any in whom he lives. We pray in Jesus' precious name and amen. And thank you all for spending this short moment with me. And I hope that I was able to encourage someone to be proud of what we are. We are church of our Lord Jesus Christ of the apostolic faith. And we went from a handful of churches to over 500 churches. And, the, and we have become international in our membership. So let us be proud of the doctrines and teachings that Bishop Lawson built upon because his teachings were the word of God. It was not anything that he made up or that, you know, anything that he developed, but it was the, it's the word of God. And let us hold fast to our profession and let us be proud of our blackness. One thing that Bishop Lawson did also to help people, he had a credit union. There was a credit union and he encouraged many of the saints to buy and invest money in stocks and bonds. That was very unique for a Pentecostal pastor to do, and he did it. So let us be proud, not only of our African heritage, but our religious heritage. And with that, I thank you all for listening, and I trust that you have received something. And may God bless you is my prayer in Jesus Christ's name. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Deacon Stewart, for that wonderful workshop. I mean, we definitely learned a lot about our uh, founder, uh, Bishop R.C. Lawson, just the great things you know, that he did. And this is Black History Month, and we thank you for providing us with this history, you know, lesson, you know, tonight. And I definitely was encouraged and inspired. There was a lot of things that, you know, I learned you know, about our founder, especially, you know, one thing that stood out was, uh, you know, when he started his churches, you know, 60% of them were Black, 40% was White. And now you look at here we are in 2022 and, you know, race retention was a lot different back then <laughs> than it is now. And uh, yes. it's hard to find many black churches, you know, uh, with uh, white members, let alone interracial. I mean, I just want to ask you a question, you know, in your opinion, through your research, what do you think, you know, uh, changed? I think our ministry focus has changed, mm -hmm. you know, um, to win people, you have to witness to them and you have to go out and meet them. And in the early days of the church, 
or what was practiced was personal evangelism because a lot of the members of the churches um, went out passing tracts, they went out witnessing. A lot of people came to the church also because Bishop Lawson was also was a faith healer. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people that was healed miraculously, they would go out and tell others because there was a time in the old church, you see wheelchairs and crutches you know, people got healed and left their, their, their crushes and their wheelchairs there, and that had an impact. So, but I think also the people had a love for souls and they had a love for the doctrine. They had a love for the apostolic doctrine. And part of the doctrine was to go in and witness and share the love of Jesus to others, regardless of race, nationality, or, or social status. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, and, and, and that's, um, like you said, you know, Bishop uh, Lawson, you know, he, he taught the word of God and the, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He's no respected to, a person. He wants everybody, you know, to be saved. He doesn't want anybody to perish. You know, he died for the entire world. That's everybody in the world. Mm -hmm. I don't know. You know, you see the book of Acts chapter two, it fell, the, the Holy Ghost fell on the Jews. Yes. Acts chapter eight, it fell on, you know, the, the, the Samaritans and mixed nationalities. Then Acts chapter mm -hmm. 10, it falls on, you know, the Gentiles. And, mm -hmm. you know, the Lord is filling people from all races, you know, with the Holy yes. Ghost. It shows that God, you know, he's no respect to a person. He doesn't he, he doesn't believe in, uh, you know, racism at all. No. He'll feel anybody nobody. with the Holy Ghost. Whosoever believes in the Lord, oh, can yeah. be saved. Hallelujah. And I'm trying to encourage you tonight during this history lesson. Hallelujah. Oh, it doesn't matter what color you are. It doesn't matter what culture, what your cultural background is. Hallelujah. Yeah. You know, Jesus loves you. Hallelujah. He wants everybody, oh, to come to the knowledge of the truth. He wants everybody, oh, to be saved in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So if you haven't repented, yeah. if you haven't been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, you haven't been filled with the precious gift of the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues, as the Spirit of the Lord give the utterance. Hallelujah. Oh, you come to Jesus. It doesn't matter. Hallelujah. What, what your background is. It doesn't matter. Hallelujah. What color you are. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus loves you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. He loves all of us. He created all of us. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Jesus. And like I said, this is the type of God we serve. Hallelujah. We want anybody. Hallelujah. To perish. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes. So we thank you. So we thank you. You know, uh, you know, tonight, you know, as well. And one other thing I'm just going to share before we wrap up is I'm, I'm amazed, you know, by uh, the vision that, you know, Lawson had. He wasn't mm -hmm. just a preacher, wasn't just a teacher, but he was a businessman. He was out there, you know, providing jobs, you know, you know for people. And uh, that's that's big. And the last thing that you said, too, how he encouraged, you know, us to, uh, you know, get into the stock market. You know, it's awesome. mm -hmm. we have a great founder. Yeah, we, we, do. Great history. we have a great her heritage, Cool JC. Yeah. And our founder said he wanted us to add down to it. And I mm -hmm. still believe that he still wants us to add down to it. So yes. let's make him proud in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So we thank you. Praise God for you. Deacon Alexander is still with. Feel free to come back anytime and bless it with some more history because we need you know, to know our history in order for us to make sure we're going in, in the right way in the future. Hallelujah, mm -hmm. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. As you Thank can you see, the green, Sunday school is big business. And yes. We are about our father's business. And before I close, I want to encourage each and every one of you to hit that like button if you like the video tonight. Subscribe if you please have subscribed. I say it all the time. Many of you have been blessed by these broadcasts. If you still haven't subscribed. Please subscribe, you know, to the Sunday school uh, channel. And we thank and praise God for each and every one of you that tunes in tonight. So, Lord willing, we'll see you next week. Until then, everybody be blessed in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, Jesus. Remember, Sunday school is big business, and we are about our Father's business, even in the midst of a pandemic. Good night, everybody. I am Karen. I attend the United Methodist Church, 462 Bain Street, Orangeburg, South Carolina, where my pastor is District Elder John H. Mosley. God bless you. And praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah.